All right, late night World War III emergency update. We got some insider intel from our friend of the channel, Rafi Farber, who is currently on the ground in Israel, and he sent us a message about what is going on there. And we got to talk about everything that is happening on the ground there. We also have to talk about some other geopolitical oddities and entities mostly pertaining to World War III in Ukraine. But let's first start with the topic of gold. Gold hit a brand new record again. Feels like every day I'm saying the same damn thing. Gold hit a new record of $2,320. 20 bucks more than yesterday, but that $20 signifies an increase in market cap of around $100 and $30 billion in real terms because the USD that it's measured in has remained relatively stable over the last six months. So we're talking about a $4 trillion revaluation of gold, purely organically driven, okay? You're not hearing about this in the media. Uh, this is being driven by central bank purchases, by maybe some rich guys, whales, you know, maybe some institutions, maybe some hedge funds quietly hedging. But by and large, this is purely organic. This is not speculative FOMO. You know, the retail investor has barely even entered the market yet. In fact, a lot of dealers of uh, metals are saying that they're running out of metals to sell. So that's how bad it is getting. So what that tells you is two things, is that the media is suppressing the price of gold, okay? They're, they're not talking about this. They have to talk about it a little bit, but they're not talking about it too much because if they talk about it a lot, that means they have to provide an analysis as to why the price of gold is going up. That's going to spook the markets. It's going to pique the interest of the retail investor. Everybody's going to FOMO in. The price is going to skyrocket. And that means that the central banks and the really wealthy people and even the other nations who are currently hoarding that and other commodities are going to have to pay more for it. They're trying to postpone that as long as possible. They know that if they were to make a big deal of this, like they do with Bitcoin and all the other speculative distractions, that people are gonna start a new tulip craze and they are going to FOMO the price. It's gonna be a melt up. There's gonna be a bit of a blow off top. There'll be a slight correction, but by and large, the price is going to stay highly elevated for an extended period of time. They don't want that. This is a barometer for social chaos. Right now, pretty much every commodity is skyrocketing in price. We're talking about oil. We're talking about copper, cocoa, coffee, uh, orange juice. The list goes on. All the commodities that are supposed to be depreciating at this point in time or being, uh, you know, showing a reduction, a deflation or even disinflation, we're not seeing that for the most part. And that's because a lot of countries are stockpiling these commodities for war, for the multipolar World War III scenario that awaits us all. Now, Rafi Farber has indicated in a tweet that he tagged us in, he's a friend of the channel, he breaks down in an interview that we did around six months ago where he predicted that things were going to start to really get crazy right around now. He talks about how the gold, how gold and precious metals are the foundation of our financial system. Everything derives its value from gold. And his prediction is that when the whole fiat derivative scheme collapses, everything will be revaluated according to gold, proportionally so. So one ounce of gold, you know, he's saying it could be 30,000, 50,000, 100,000. I'm not saying that, that's not financial advice, but uh, it appears as though it could happen. Anyways, what he's saying with respect to what's going on in Israel right now is that the Bank of Israel, in a secret message to banks, have advised them to prepare for a run on the ATMs. This is due to the imminent home front command media blitz warning residents to prepare for war. So, right now, the Israeli government is scaring the shit out of the population uh, because, of course, they targeted three brigadier generals of the Iranians at the Iranian consulate in Syria, which is effectively an act of war because it's on Iranian soil. Other high-ranking uh, Iranian officials went down as well. They are expecting a retaliation. In fact, the CIA released a memo yesterday that said that they are expecting in the next 48 hours there's going to be a retaliation. Now, they're making it out as if this is going to come directly from Iran. 
And, uh, I mean, we'll talk about some of the reasons why I don't think that's very likely. But on the topic of this ATM situation, this is all the more reason. I want to give some practical advice right now. Cash is going to be king in the early phases of any collapse scenario. You need cash. Now, first and foremost, you have to ask yourself, why would I need cash? Okay, well, maybe you have to evacuate and maybe you lose all your preps. That's really the only reason why, because anything that you would need cash for, you should be prepping for first. But everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, as Mike Tyson says. So you have to have that backup plan first and foremost, as much as some people like to stack precious metals, and I'm not really one of those people, but I understand this, the importance of precious metals. Um, one thing that you have to do is make sure that you have a lot of cash on hand because these ATMs are gonna be cleaned out very quickly because you gotta remember something else. We are now in a debit-based, credit card-based society. There simply is not as much physical cash in circulation as there used to be. So there's not nearly enough cash for the entire population there. Now, they have a culture of preparedness. As far as I know, most people there go through basic training in the military. They're indoctrinated with all that stuff, and I'm sure they learn a few skills as well. They all have access to safety shelters. They all know the drill. And the Israelis have been preparing for, you know, World War III for some period of time. So they're probably more insulated from a major crisis like this than we are here in the West. But don't discount cash in the early phases of collapse. Yeah, a few months go by. People don't believe in the financial system anymore. Then maybe your silver, your precious metals, your jewelry, or your commodities and barter, that's going to come in handy. But in the initial phases of the disaster, cash will be king, okay? So make sure you have some on hand. Now, here's what else is going on in Israel. As I said, they are on a high state of alert. They are waiting for reprisal from the Iranians. I don't think it's going to come from Iran. Iran is going to view this as a provocation by the Israelis to goad them into the conflict that Israel needs right now. Benjamin Netanyahu needs a conflict. Okay, For starters, it gets all of those protesters off the street. You see how convenient it is to have air raid sirens and uh, all these threats that people, you know, got to make sure they know where the shelters are and all the shelters are open. It scares people away from protesting. And night after night, from what I'm told, there's been a lot of protest activity in Israel. This is a great way to suppress those protests. Okay, so they want a war. And I don't know how they plan on waging it. I don't think our Western leaders or the Israelis, for that matter, really think that far ahead. I don't think they've thought this one through. There's no way you're going to win a war with Iran, even if it goes nuclear. It's just going to be a bloody, miserable mess for everybody involved. So is Iran going to attack Israel directly? I highly doubt it. They're going to do it by proxy. Recall that a few months ago, they targeted a, I believe it was, they claim, the Iranians claim it was a Mossad agent in Syria and his family or something like that. And uh, was the longest range ballistic missile that Iran ever shot from its territory into another country, apparently. Now, they could do that into Israel. They could launch just tons of missiles and they could probably, you know, destroy the Israeli power grid. They could destroy the Demona nuclear power plant and that would trigger the Samson option and the United States would get involved. It would be World War III. They're not going to do that. What they're going to do is they're going to attack via proxy. They're going to activate their proxies in the surrounding regions. And this is just, I'm not a military expert in this region. I'm not there. But common sense would dictate they want a modulated response. They need a measured response so that it doesn't escalate vertically. But they also don't want to be viewed as a paper tiger. So the optics of this are important to the theocracy in Iran. As much as they are somewhat objectivist like the, the Russians in some ways in terms of how they wage war, meaning that they're not going to be triggered into an immediate reaction. They will likely settle for a Pyrrhic response, meaning that the response might not even accomplish much, but it will appease their population who are going to say, well, at least they did something. And it will seem like a small victory, a retaliation and redemption for the loss of their generals. But what they likely won't do yet, even though they're, they're preparing for it, 
the Iranians are preparing for war with Israel, full-blown war. There's a reason why they're building all those bunkers and stockpiling all that shit. That shit is going to be used someday. But I think they want to do it on their own terms. But if we know that the war in the Middle East is inevitable, then both sides are incentivized to go on the initiative. So if you know that war is coming, why would you wait for the 50 F-15 Strike Eagle jets that the Americans are now sending to the Israelis as a part of this $18 billion aid package. These jets, apparently, I don't know much about it, but I'm suspecting that they have a longer range. So these are the jets that they're going to use if they do uh, stage an attack on the Iranian nuclear facilities that are now completed and no longer as thoroughly being monitored by the International Atomic Energy Agency. These are all underground. So that tells you that the Iranians are preparing for this thing. This is what they've been preparing for. So if you know that that's about to happen, why wouldn't you seize upon the opportunity from the Iranian and the proxy and all the other uh, Arab countries in the region? Why wouldn't you seize upon that opportunity and go on the initiative right now? Of course, Israel has nukes or America has nukes. Let's be honest. Okay, that's really kind of what's going on here, I think. And that's where a lot of Israel's nuclear ambiguity uh, comes into play is that it's probably really the American stuff. Uh, anyways, so they're going to utilize the Samson option. It's going to get nuclear. It's going to get ugly. What I think is going to happen, hopefully, for now, war is coming there. That's basically guaranteed at this point that they're going to start a war with Hezbollah and it's going to be destructive to both sides. Uh, you know, the Israelis have what are these 1500 pound bombs, 2000 pound bombs, JDAMs bombs that they're getting ready. And uh, that's going to wreak havoc. It's not going to destroy the underground tunnel network systems. And I don't think that the Israelis have enough missile defense. I don't think that the population there truly realizes the hellfire that is going to rain down when the war actually begins. It is going to be brutal. GPS jamming abound throughout the entire region. Okay, Israel is canceling vacation calls for their reservists who they just relieved of duty due to the uh, operations starting to not wind down. I mean, they're gonna wind up again in Rafa, but in other parts of Northern Gaza. 77,000 reservists have been called up. They're opening up emergency shelters. It's very likely that Iran is now going to accelerate its nuclear program in response to this. What other option do they have? Okay, so that this is what's going to happen. They're going to accelerate. So, and this is the self-fulfilling prophecy of all of this. This was all to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons. And now Iran is going to feel insecure enough that they need to have nuclear weapons. People are supposedly fleeing Haifa as well. Now, in terms of the other geopolitical oddities that are going on right now. Emmanuel Macron has reiterated that France does not need NATO's support in Ukraine, basically saying that Article 5 will not be triggered when the troops start filing in. Now, according to Maria Zakharova, spokesperson for the Russian government, she says that 1,500 French troops will be deployed to Ukraine in April and that it's already approved. Right now, they are on full combat readiness in April to deploy to the Ukrainian theater of operations. Very likely assisting in logistics in the rear, but I don't think it will take long for them to uh, permeate the entirety of uh, the country in some capacity and basically just be intermixed with the uh, Ukrainian military. Russia has done a ballistic missile test. They did, they did a strategic missile test on the Kura missile range on the far eastern Arctic coast. Apparently the U.S., in response to this, two U.S. Air Force RC-135S uh, ballistic missile tracking aircraft were put up in the air. And why this is important, because I don't think that the Russians notified this, us about this, because there did not appear to be any communication. Usually, NORAD would issue some sort of uh, advisory that Russia had notified them and that this was a standard test and all that stuff. But because there's no more treaties, this is uh, very concerning because, of course, the United States has a policy called launch on warning. And what that means, oops, what that means is essentially if they detect that the Russians are launching nuclear missiles, 
then that is grounds for them to launch everything that they have. So perhaps this was the Russians uh, putting the Americans on notice. Perhaps this is just a way that they were trying to test us to see what our response would be. And, you know, that this was a trial run because what you'd want to see is, okay, if we were going to do a decapitation strike, if we were going to attempt the first strike, we got to test it out first. We want to see what's going to happen when we put just one in the air. We know there's a 95% chance that the Americans are just going to know it's a test and they're not going to launch everything. But let's just see what they do. What kind of planes do they put in the air? What kind of jets do they scramble? What do they do? Okay, and I think that's what this was about. They're trying to smoke us out of our holes. So that's serious. That's sending us a warning shot. Because right now, here's what's going on. This is crazy. Zelensky bought a house in Britain. Did you hear about this in the news? I highly doubt it. Zelensky bought a house in Britain. This is 100% fact, as far as I know. Okay. I hope, I hope it is, because you, you, know, you guys know how I feel about providing you with valid and uh, information that, is, you know, that you can take to the bank. For 20 million pounds, British pounds, he bought a home from Charles III. Okay, who else is currently residing in the UK? His old buddy, Valerie Zaluzny. Right now, Zelensky is replacing his entire cabinet. Why is he doing this? Well, some people speculate, like myself included, that maybe the war isn't going so well. Maybe NATO is getting ready to take over the reins, which is why the French foreign minister was on a phone call today with Sergei Shoigu, the Russian defense minister. And uh, Zelensky is going to do some sort of leadership from exile thing and spend his remaining days just hopping from one mansion to another. $20 million. Now, I'm not knocking the guy's hustle, okay? I mean, boy, was it a hustle. Actually, some people might call it quite the racket. I mean, we're talking about over a hundred billions of dollars dumped into this whole scheme, okay? And this guy has the audacity to just buy a $20 million mansion in the UK while telling everybody that the war is going great, people aren't evacuating from Kharkov, which they are, by the way, that's now confirmed, I've been talking about that one for the last two days. I was a little uncertain that I was giving you guys false information, but it it's, turns out that it is in fact true. But this is, this is bad because this means that he's really getting ready to leave the country and uh, leave from exile. That's what this appears to be because right now they're saying that the Russians are getting ready to do an offensive and that it's going to happen likely in the next couple months if the Ukrainians can't get the artillery that they need to fend them off. And of course, we have more threats from the Ukrainian foreign minister, Dmitro Kaluba, or Kaliba, saying that I'm not exaggerating when I say that Europe will be at war and missiles will fall on Brussels. Patriot systems can intercept missiles in Ukraine, or they will do so in Europe. And he references the fact that right now the Ukrainians have been given seven Patriot systems, but a hundred Patriot systems are still available, according to them. So I don't know how many missiles are had for said systems, but uh, I would say that that's just another threat. Now, what's going on in Kharkov, I've been talking about this for the last two days, came out today, according to the statement uh, by a Kharkov, the Kharkov mayor in the second most populous city in Ukraine, all critical energy infrastructure facilities have been partially disabled and it's going to cost them 10 billion dollars to fix 10 billion okay so you can't tell me that that grid is not severely compromised when it's going to cost you 10 billion unless that's just another racket that they're putting up they're probably just throwing out numbers uh, regardless it's confirmed that there is in fact evacuations going on in the surrounding regions there's more bombardments there tonight as I'm doing this video. So I think that's only going to ramp up. So that's pretty much confirmed guys that uh, the shit's hitting the fan in Ukraine. My Polish source has responded to an inquiry I made last night where I asked a question out loud about what Poles think. What do Poles actually think about potentially going to war? And uh, this is what he had to say. And this is important because of course that's the most likely next front, I'd say, after Moldova, Lithuania. 
He says, an answer is an opinion poll published today, which reads that only 11% of those questions declared that they would go to the, uh, the fight on the front, whilst 20% declared that they would immediately leave Poland. 20%, one in five. Can you imagine the congested roadways? The rest would state that they would stay, but only in support in a non-combatant role. However, in the crucial age bracket of 18 to 35, nearly 30% said they would immediately get out of Dodge. That's not a lot of commitment, uh, unless there is some massive false flag operation to motivate people to partake in such a conflict. I don't think it's going to happen. That's what you would need to have happen. You need to build up that hatred of Russia for it to happen, but it might not be Russia. That's the irony. They might turn on each other. They might turn on the Ukrainians. Who knows at this point in time? And uh, there's some other information here. I'm not sure it will be that relevant, but the Minister of Defense in Poland has stated that in current situation, there is no alternative but to direct all resources to the war economy in light of that, he said, because armament factories which belong to the government cannot keep up with demand, private companies will now be contracted to also move to making munitions and other military equipment. Zelensky claims that Russia is mobilizing. He's claiming that the Russians are planning on mobilizing another 300,000 people by June 1st. Now, the Russians are claiming we don't need that. We get 30,000 volunteers a month. In fact, I think on the week of... The Crocus uh, terrorist attacks, they got another like 18,000 applications or something. So, but I will say though, you know, usually the saying is where there's smoke, there's fire. Usually with what the Ukrainians say or Zelensky, you know, where there's smoke, there's like some smoldering coals, you know, buried under some dirt somewhere. Uh, but I do think that there's probably something to it because you never can really trust what the Russians say either. And, uh, I would not be surprised if they did plan on mobilizing a lot more troops. In fact, if they do want to uh, fully see through what they've committed to, which is creating a sanitary zone, and that's from the horse's mouth, Vladimir Putin himself, all the way up to Lviv, Lvov, whatever you want to call it, then they're going to need a hell of a lot of troops. Even if, even if Ukraine is only relegated to using their miniature dragon's teeth and very limited artillery okay uh, even if the french troops don't come you know it's going to take a lot of manpower in order to do what they need to do and then you're talking of course about guerrilla warfare after that so you need enough you need a lot of troops on the ground to uh, keep a population that large in line so i guess we're going to see what's going to happen but sparks are going to fly soon guys i would not be surprised that by the time i woke up tomorrow morning we had more big news to talk about. And oh yeah, the price of coffee, you might want to start stocking up because not only is the price of cocoa skyrocketing, but apparently coffee has now gone up another 50% in like the last, what is it, eight months? That's insane. So keep on prepping, folks. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Can name prep out?